Okay, guys. This is the first recording on drafting of pleadings. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time is you're watching this. And uh, you are now looking at the recording in terms of the drafting of pleadings for the pupillage training program. All right, you all know who I am. James Clark, advocate of the High Supreme Court and also a doctoral in divinity, a subdivision of theology. All right, so that's my introduction. That's not important. What is important is that we're going to spend a little bit of time together now uh, in the pre preparation of uh, your September exams because uh, you will get drafting a question. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it and it's going to, the mark allocated to it's going to be quite extensive. So it's important that uh, you try and get most of that, as much of those marks as you can. So uh, before we go to this drafting of pleadings and what we're going to do in drafting of pleadings is we're going to concentrate on particulars of claims and uh, yeah, do you oppose them and all of those things. But the first part where we have to start is uh, the drafting. How do you draft the particulars of claim under an action procedure? Now, remember, there's a difference between an action procedure and an um, uh, 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 application procedure, right? Uh, application procedures, founding affidavits, etc., etc., where action procedures are, are, are particulars of claims. All right, so we're going to work on particulars of claims. So, all right, sit back, stop this, go get a cup of tea, uh, go get a pen and paper, because we're going to be working out of two books. Remember, this is self-assessment. You're becoming an advocate. This is self-assessment. So I'm just going to guide you through this. But I want to make an introduction because I believe in practicality. I hate it when professors and advocates try to explain something to you. And, and even after you've uh, um, been successful at university, getting your LLB degree, you, don't, you still don't understand how to do certain things. Um, so it's important for me to start off with a short introduction. I want to quickly, if you have your pen and paper in front of you, I want to quickly, before I look at a book, I want to show you how to draft the particulars of claim. And this is the template, this is the structure, out of my head. I've, really, if I have to think, guys, respected future colleagues, um, if I have to think about how many POCs I have drafted, POC, particulars of claim, and I might be using those abbreviations from time to time. Um, LOD, letter of demand, all right? I must have drafted hundreds of, if not, no, I don't want to say thousands, but literally hundreds, hundreds of particulars of claims, founding affidavits, representations in criminal court pleadings. I cannot tell you how many more I've drafted, but when I started out, when I was sitting where you sitting now, it, it was very difficult. You don't really know what to do, and there's not really anybody helping you. And people that explain to you verbally, they explain in such a manner you then can you can really not understand it. All right. The first thing with particulars of claim is we make averments, short, concise averments. Um, where in founding affidavits you tell a story, not wasting words and sentences, paragraphs, but you tell a story. Where in a part particulars of claim we're not telling a story. We chronologically setting in short and concise averments. Right, here we are. This is what happens. All right, do you have your pen there? Do you have your cup of tea, your coffee? No alcohol. <laughs> so let's have a look at it. When you do a particulars of claims, always type the heading particular of claims. That's important for me. All they bold, go up there, underline, say particulars of claim, type it out. Doesn't matter when you whether you put it to uh, to the combined summons or whatever the situation is. Remember, particulars of claim, action procedures, summons, simple summons, combined summons. Application procedures, affidavits, notice of motions, ex parte applications, uh, ex parte that that cover page is still a notice of motion. All right. So we're not looking at that. We're working with action procedures, which is attached to, to summonses, very simple combined and particulars of claim. Easy, eh? Right, now write down. The first heading you put, according to me, all the years I've been doing it, is parties. Parties. Who is the parties? The citation, or let me rather say the citing of parties. So that's what you're going to do first. I'm going to quickly give you a template. Before I look at anybody's book or go anywhere, I do it with contracts too, and you'll see my advanced contracts in um, uh, drafting clip. 
uh, that I'm busy with currently for, for corporate. And as soon as I'm finished with that, not a time is the essence to you. I keep on saying that. So you understand, I understand it's not the essence for you. I'm sitting here now, but you're seeing it at your leisure. And then you also see, I start off, uh, I usually do basic contracts, but not with you guys. You're becoming advocates. So we are doing advanced contracts immediately with you, but my first chapter, calm down. My first chapter I'm going to discuss with corporate, which that clip will be loaded for this, is how to set up a contract, a basic template contract you can use for any contract. Any contract in the world. And this is what I want to do with you with POC, parties. All right, this is a template. So you write it down, you keep it in a file, or you scan it and you load it electronically in the electronic file. All right, before I start further, or before I start or go further, where's your external hard drive? You become an advocate, you become a legal practitioner. Where is your external hard drive? What is your external hard drive? Yeah, that's right. It's the one you plug here into the, into the laptop, verbratum or whatever, make. where's your external hard drive? Immediately purchase an external hard drive if you don't have one. Don't save it on your laptop. Get an expensive external hard drive, one that if it falls or can bump, it doesn't damage easily. So go and do a little bit of research. From now on, you're becoming a legal practitioner. The rest of your career, you must have one external hard drive for all your templates. Under training, and then when you start practicing, all the templates. If you put up a partnership or you do a POC for a divorce, template, template. You need the electronic external hard drive to start saving all your stuff. You have no idea the library you're going to build for yourself electronically, and you have no idea you're going to speed up your work after you've practiced for two, three, four years. And uh, somebody walks you off and says, well, this, yeah, I've done it before. You pull it up, you tweak it, you make certain it's fine. You double read it, triple read it. You put up a first draft, second draft, fourth draft, final draft, and everybody's happy. You need the external hard drive. So you can build your own library. It starts with training because Nowadays, on a practical vocational training, Regulation 7, becoming advocates, <clears throat> this is what we're teaching you. Template, 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 all right? So if you don't have an external hard drive, make a plan or start backing the stuff up that you gather and you're busy with um, um, on your laptop, on your computer, but uh, as soon as possible on external hard drive that you can always take with you, a small one, maybe three terabytes or something like that, and you can put it in your laptop, laptop um, um, because they're becoming smaller and smaller, you can put it in your laptop uh, 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 casing back, and wherever you go, you just plug it in. Um, I went on vacation one day, <clears throat> there in Elspreet, and uh, we went there to a lodge we didn't know, booked in and signed in. People ask, what do you do? Got chatting, now you're an advocate. Listen, we got a problem here. Found the attorney says, listen, they want me to draft something for them, but I can't without instructions, Give, gave me instructions, legalized my activities there. And while I was there on vacation, I had a system with the company sucks and all those things. And then they wanted to pay me. I said, ah, you know what? As long as you just pay the attorney for opening a file for us and you having fill in the instruction, all of those things go through the legal procedure of that. That's fine. So no, I really won't pay you. And uh, I said, I don't want payment. And it turns out later on, they gave my wife a diamond. She lost one of her small diamonds on her marriage ring, and, she, and they gave the diamond, which I, I wasn't, wasn't payment for me because that would be illegal, right? So I said, no, I don't want payment. You know, we're there, we're enjoying ourselves. And uh, sometimes I don't mind helping people if they approach me in a correct manner. But stay away from pro bonus there. Yeah? too much pro bonus, but you'll be surprised what happens. If you've got your external hard drive with you, with your laptop, immediately I could pluck and I say, there's your problem. Uh, if you restructure this lodge in this manner on the Companies Act, that's what you need to do. Okay, please help us fill in. I said, no problem. Uh, let's just print the docs and get it done. All right. So that's it. Yeah, I gave that diamond. Can't believe that. Eh? They had the jewelry shop at the back in a lodge. All right, guys, are you ready? All right, number one is parties. The first thing you ever do with a POC, you identify who, your parties and who is your parties. This is an action procedure, so your parties is, um, um, I just want to write something down, just excuse me for a second, your parties are plaintiff and defendant, all right? I just need to write down, what am I writing down? Guys, what am I writing down now? You're an advocate, what am I writing down? I'm writing down the time I started here. Otherwise, if I don't do that, then I cannot do my hour billing. All right, there we are. Let's put a smiley face there. Do you see what I just did? Remember that. 
You don't have to forget. I started here and I almost forget to write my time down. I've already been busy with you guys a couple of times. So you're working with a plaintiff and a defendant because in motion procedures, obviously, applicant responded. So you need to identify your parties. And it can be multiple parties. So heading number one, parties. How many plaintiffs are there? How many defendants are there? Which people or, or let me rather say which natural or juristic entities is involved here? Are you going to cite all the plaintiffs that's possibly involved here? Are you going to cite all the defendants that's possibly involved here? Is there a reason why you wouldn't do it? You need to identify your parties. All right. That's number one. You need to identify your parties. And if you have your parties, then you are ready to go to the next step. Next step, that's number two, jurisdiction. Always, 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 always. You identify parties. I always go next to jurisdiction. A lot of guys build it the other end. No, I don't do it because then sometimes you forget. And if you don't cite jurisdiction, you've got a problem. All right? Especially in the high court. But you've got to cite it always. I have a habit. We are going into uniform rules for all the courts. We are dragging all these 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 these, these rules together for the sake of uniformity. Should have done been done years ago in South Africa, because in the magistrate court, so many high courts, so many that's confusing. Now we're getting to uniformity. So parties, find out who your parties is. We're working with plaintiffs and defendants. It can be multiple ones, and then cite your jurisdiction. Now, well, this court is jurisdiction because the cause of action happened here, or whatever your jurisdiction is. And remember. A lot of people don't understand this, but your jurisdiction is also inadvertently a lot of the times linked to local standing. So number one is you do your parties, then you do jurisdiction, heading, heading, jurisdiction. Now, after you, you do jurisdiction, you um, um, do facts. Now you can, and, and in your particulars of claim, give them these headings, parties, bold, underline it, jurisdiction, bold, underline, then you go to your facts. What is the facts? For example, if it's based on, a, based on a contract, then you would say uh, on so-and-so day at where, Pretoria, Johannesburg, we engage in a contract, blah, 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 and then you will set out the facts, the facts. It doesn't matter if it's a breach of contract or based on a contract or whether it's divorce or delictual defamation, the facts, the facts. I'll get back to technicalities in a, in a situation, but you, you set up concise shortly the facts, all right? So what do we have? You're writing this down. This is a basic template. If you can do this, I'm landing you. I'm landing you. You can do a POC. And this is not a professor university that's trying to muggle with your brain. And it's really easy. It's not necessary. It's so easy. Uh, everybody fears them. Don't fear this, by the way. Don't fear this, all right? Although it's self-assessment, we're going to go through the books quickly, show you where's what. you got to get there on your own. I'm going to tell you. Parties, jurisdiction, facts, all right? Facts. Do you have that? Now, after facts, what happened? We engaged in a contract or I was walking in a park or whatever the situation will be. You put it out there. Then the wrongdoing. You can give it the heading you want to. You can go wrongdoing. Then you say, well, you know, on the facts, we're busy with a contract. Explained what a contract is, when we signed it, what it's all about. And then on the wrongdoing, what happened? Was there a breach? What happened? How was the breach? Put it out. Put it out. All right. OK, so let's see. Let's see. I tell you, this is an, a template I use in my chambers for years. Parties, jurisdiction, facts, wrongdoing. Now, damages or recourse, because it's not always damages, is it? It can be recourse. Uh, that's got nothing to do with damages, but we'll look at that. Don't get stressed out. So what we want now is damages slash recourse. So, Due to the four minutes that I sustained damages, or due to the four minutes I lost this, I want this back, or what, what? What is the situation? What is the situation here? All right. So damages. All right. Parties, jurisdiction, facts, wrongdoing, damages. All right. Now, notices or statutory notices or both. That's the next one. Number one, parties. Number two, jurisdiction. Number three, facts. Number four, what went wrong? Number five, damages sustained or the result or whatever the, the, the situation is. And the next one is notices. Whether it's statutory notices under the National Credit Act, like I issued the 129 letter, or whether it's a letter of demand. Applicant will uh, send a demand to pay this and uh, up to the issuing of this summons, no payment has been forthcoming, something like that, all right? So this is attachments usually, although, although, under facts, if we dealt with a contract, then it would be attached to 
or the specific page in the contract that refers to the clause in which we are litigating. A couple of tricks there. We'll get to that later. All right. So let's quickly do this before I forget what's going on. Parties, jurisdiction, facts, wrongdoing, damages. What, what, what do I want here? What, what, what happened to me? What was the impact of this? Ne? All right. And then uh, we go to notices, whether they're statutory or not. Whether it's a normal letter of uh, uh, demand or on the state organs, state of uh, organs uh, act, there's a letter or on the national crack, there's a one to nine letter. You attach it ne? and you say, well, you attach the return of service there. And remember to make mention that a dish has expired. The dish what the heck is that? What's a dish? Is it a dish, a curry dish? No. All right. A dish is, for example, easy peasy. In the letter of demand, I say within seven days you have to pay me. That's the dish. Do you see it? The seven days. So if that seven days has, has gone by, the dish has expired. And always remember, I always used to do it. You don't always have to do it. But I always used to send these things via sheriff. You can fax step, you can email me, we do that, but I follow it up with a sheriff because our sheriff, because sheriff, <laughs> sheriff, because I want in court that return of service. That return of service speaks much loudly sometimes than other documents, right? Now, that's the basic template, all right? Parties, facts, wrongdoing, what damages does I sustain? What happened? What was the result? Right? Notices or statutory notices. And now we go to prayers. Wherefore, the plaintiff or, or the second and uh, the first and second plaintiff prays against the respondents, or you can break it up. Maybe uh, we pray against the second respondents for that, against the third respondent, not respondent. Ah, you got me, defendant. We, we break it up. And then we set out our prayers. Ne? All right. Or the one to absolve the other one. So a couple of directions you can go there. Now, you set out your prayers, eh? and please, you always end your prayers. Whatever you ask in your prayers, you always end it with further alternative relief. And above that, two things you end with. Your costs, cost in the course, or cost of the suit, or part in party, whatever it is. When you have a contract, you can actually go there. So your prayers will always end with two things. Cost, whatever you're going to do there, and further alternative relief. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's your prayers. And then, of course, on top of it, you know, damages to the amount of this with the more I interest to this or whatever the situation is. But your prayers will always end. The second last one will deal with cost and the last one will always do alternative, further alternative relief. Because if you put it in there, I saw one day I was in a court case where they forgot to put it in and the advocate said to the very difficult judge, well, I don't know what to do further if that is what a bench or a court is saying. So take it into your own hands. He says, I cannot do that. He said, no, but you can do it because of further alternative relief. He said, the advocate, look into your prayers. It wasn't there. I cannot do it. All right, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, any, I'm not taking instructions uh, uh, from the bar and up to the bench. All right, so that's what we're doing there. All right, so that is what's important there. All right, so that's your particulars of claim. That's it. Last thing before we start going into the books. Eh? Last thing before we start going into the books. Listen, this is a trick and a lot of people make a mistake here. They ask for stuff in the prayers that's not on top. Do you remember that Cremora advertisement? Oh, that gives my age away. Ah, <laughs> in any event. You cannot ask anything in a prayer that you have not canvassed on the top, on the facts and 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 what went wrong and the da and what is the damages and all of those things. Um, if it's not in there, and I've caught so many people in, in court cases, I walk in, I've seen this, I walk in and they're busy and I say, no, but they can't get it. And sometimes even a judge is like, but why not? I say, well, okay, let me show you. There's the prayer, show me in the top, in that whole POC where they canvas it. So oh, they can't get it. All right, so whatever you ask in the prayers must be relatable to what happened and what you described in there. A lot of people's may, people make that further, all right? Okay, another thing, court interest. Years ago, we kind of kept it at 15.5, if I can remember. For years, it was kept, not anymore. Eh? So you have to look at those acts. You have to look at the a, at a direct, practice directors that come from the court. That's another mistake people make, all right? So you've got to make certain you cite the right court interest, all right? Court interest is very important. And try 
if you can try and fight for court interest from the date of of the letter of demand uh, being issued, uh, uh, play around with that. See how far you can take it back because it's beneficial to your client. All right, there's, uh, there's, there's court cases on that. You better go and read up on those guys. All right, that is the easiest way. What do you think? You want me to give you the template again? To say it again? I'll repeat myself a hundred times to you if I have to. I don't mind because I were with you were now and I understand. A lot of people talk a lot of difficult stuff to you. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. There's no reason for me to sit here and present myself as super clever to you and you don't understand the word I'm saying. Oh, you remember, yeah, we're still on the sinus bus. Okay. Parties. Jurisdiction. Facts, and remember, within the facts, between jurisdiction and the facts, there must be locus standi. All right? I must have an interest. I must have an interest. All right? The facts, the wrongdoing, the damages, what, what, what now? What do I want? What did I sustain? What happened to me? Why is my feelings hurt? Notices of statutory notices. Remember all the documents you have to attach. You use the sheriff, get out of the return service. Prayers, set out your prayers. The last two ish points of your prayers will always be relatable to cost, what cost you want, and further or further or and alternative relief, whatever that situation is there. All right. That's it. That's your template. You have it. You have it. But now we have to go into the technicalities, into a uh, uh, senior counsel advocate to sign some um, book. We're going to page through it, talk a little bit about it. And I also want to deal with arms. And uh, with arms, I'll deal in the second clip. All I'm going to do now, I'm going to go. I don't want to give you too much in one clip. I'm going to make this two recordings. OK, so we deal with practical drafting skills of a sign. And remember, we told you to buy it. Buy it eh? Did you buy it? Because uh, I'm going to page through it. And I'm going to try and go slowly and just show you places you should look at. A very good book. Thank you, Judge Hussain. He was a judge on the bench. Thank you very much for this. This is a very good book. And uh, it's been overdue uh, in South Africa because people pretend they're clever. And uh, although the judge is very clever, he put it in a manner to fully canvas it with you. OK, let me just think about a second. I've said that. I've dealt with that. I've dealt with that. I'm happy. You have the template now, all right? Okay. Are you ready? I hope you have this practical drafting skills book. If you don't, just listen to what I'm saying and get it as quickly as possible. It's a very good book. And uh, I really think, um, but but the most of his books, you can look out for Judge Hussain's book. You'll see most of his books are, all his books I've seen, not most of his books, all his books I've seen is very good. All right, guys, let's quickly have a look at it. Let me come closer so that if I bend down, I don't cut too much of my face off on the screen. Um, in this book, I'm going to take you first. Oh, you want to know? Oh, I see. I see what you're thinking. I have a crystal ball, didn't you know it? Um, this is uh, Ismail Hussain, SC for Senior Counsel, Practical Drafting Skills, and I'm going to do it slowly. Uh, it's a 2019 uh, publication. ISBN number, that's what you need. You order it by the ISBN number. It comes in, in, in two of them, a softback and ebook. And I have the softback book in front of me. So this ISBN number is the following, 978-0-6390-05232. And the ebook is 978-0-6390-05232. 09322. All right. But uh, I believe that that information will also be on the Elite platform when they cite a book. I'm sure Mrs. Rustoff and them and uh, the, the big boss, the coordinator, Mrs. Beeston, uh, 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 Beastly or Beeston, um, um, Michelle, I'm sure that she will have that for you there. So that's what that's all about. Comes in softback, comes in an ebook, and get it as soon as possible. Now, the reason it comes in an ebook brings a little bit of relief, doesn't it? Why? Because you can now buy this cheap. The ebook is always much cheaper. When I write religious books, the ebooks are, I mean, you can almost get them for free. I usually uh, write uh, uh, international religious books, hard, hard copy, soft copy, and, uh, and e, e book. And e book is very, 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 very cheap. So get it in e book if you have a financial restraint. All right. Before we start, are you having it hard? I mean, are you going through a tough time? 
you're becoming an advocate, resources are low, pressure is on you, maybe you're married, maybe in your 30s or 40s, you have changed the lanes, you're going to make it, all right? You're going to make it. You know why you're going to make it? I was there and I made it, all right? So if you're going through a half time, take a deep breath. You will make it if you work hard and you do it right. On page seven of this book, I want to bring unto your attention the spelling does count. Guys, be careful. There's some uh, fiery dragon judges on the bench, which I approve of. If they find a spelling mistake in your documents, they embarrass you in front of that whole motion court, especially the motion court, all right? So please be careful with that. Now, some of the judges are, the, because you're an advocate, you're becoming an advocate, all right? It is very important that you understand this. All right. So please go and look at number seven on page seven of this book. Spelling can be the bane of people's lives. It's very distracting and off putting to read a document that is riddled with spelling mistakes. We are very fortunate to have the computer that often corrects spelling for us, but don't relax and allow the computer to do all your editing for you. That's where my problem comes in because it's South African, it's British, it's American English. And, and sometimes you become a victim of, of the Z's and the S's on those things. So please, spelling is very important. Now, there's another thing I want to say here. Be careful. Sometimes spelling can change the intent of the meaning. And then you're in trouble, all right? I've been in a court case like that. I defended the Minister of Health against uh, this scheme. And... Uh, a very respected senior advocate I fought against. I was, there was years ago, I was still not a junior. I suppose I was a junior senior and I fought against a very respected uh, senior advocate. I have a lot of respect for a very good advocate. And he came out with crevices, crevices. <laughs> yes. All right. I was happy to survive that assault. Um, and we had a win-win situation there, which means nobody really won, but nobody definitely didn't. We didn't lose. You'll have that a lot. So please, important there. Eh? Be careful of spelling. You can actually uh, get into such a fight about it. And the courts, they can be funny. Most judges will rule in favor and say, ah, I can see the spelling mistake. But then you can very other judges, stern judges, say, no, you spell it like that, we're going to the ordinary dictionary and you're in trouble. All right? So that was then there on page seven uh, in Judge Hussain's book. I'm going to call him a judge because he's my peer and I respect him. I'm not going to call him advocate. I think it's it. He was a judge. It's a judge in my eyes. So very good book. Page 13. Do you have it electronically? Page 10. The length of sentence. Now I'm not reading what I'm saying here. I'm reading two free two free sentences to you. Self evaluation. You've got to do this yourself. I'll read about two free sentences, but then I'll give you my take on it. One of the biggest factors that inhibit readability is the length of sentences. Uh, so as a rule of thumb, the sentence should not really exceed 25 words. And when you look at my contract teachings, you'll see 50 words. But this is very true, guys. Concise means concise. A word must be concise in a particular sort of claim means that you keep it short and sweet, down to the point. We always say in POCs, which is a rule, you don't plead evidence. Well, don't make a mistake. Eh? I used to specialize in medical negligence. Some of my particulars of claims are over 60, 80 pages long. And in some of my um, uh, uh, deluxe claims, same. So sometimes it becomes a necessity to go long. But actually, it should never happen. It's one of those few occasions where it must happen. So please, on page 13, go and read what I say there. He says a lot about the length of sentences. And he brings it down to 25 words. And I agree with it because this is not a contract. This is action procedure and, and this is very important. Now, remember when I gave you the template now, you must understand that you must still consult the rules that tells you how parties must be cited. If you are dealing with contracts, what must happen if you deal with contracts in an in a action procedure? And then you still have to understand you must observe legislation, those requirements, those formalities, those technicalities. I've given you bare template which means you are there. Now you have to put a meat to it and you have to know your rules, right? If you don't know your rules that, 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 that guides you and enforces upon you, 
when you cite the party, we want that as in. If you cite the case on a contract, we want that in there. Um, actual procedures must look like this. It must be set out like this. You're also going to be wrong. All right. But we have a template. Just to say, uh, giving us good templates in here, and we'll get to that in a second. So the length of the sentence is very important for me. You must understand it, must keep it as short as possible. This does not apply to founding affidavits on application procedures. I usually take a, a long road there, but I will also teach you not to say ridiculous thing and waste time and say things that there's no value or whatever the situation might be. Might be. All right. OK, so now we're going to go basically to chapter one, actually, the facts of your case. And that is page 19. Now, before I say anything about the facts of your case, I want to bring you back to consultation and the drafting of pleadings. Guys, I've set up some pleadings where I had webinar, well, not webinar, but electronic groups or, you know, uh, Skype um, or emails. That is very dangerous because even if you're on Skype in those places, you're kind of limited. All right, we are moving into a new century when new things are happening. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, your consultations has to be thorough. You cannot draft under your application procedures. You cannot draft the particulars of claim if you don't know everything. So when an attorney brings me in to do something, in the cases the guys I work with, they know. They say to the client, stop. We're going to get an advocate and don't tell us anything because you're going to have to retell it to give us this specific advocate. He wants to be there from the beginning. And the reason I do that is for the sake of drafting correctly. I want all the facts. Then I walk into the ballroom, the attorney of uh, record is sitting there, the clients are sitting there, and very quickly, before you know it, I have those clients on a cross-examination. Left, right, and center. I think they hate me in the beginning. And later on, when they see the result, then they might start to like me. I'm very aggressive about that. I want to know. I ask the clients the difficult questions. Because what happens? If you draft something and, and it's not up to scratch, you haven't asked all the questions and it goes wrong in court, who do they blame? Attorneys are very clever. They quickly blame the advocate if the advocate drafted it. All right. So I'm very strict on this. Most of my cases, I want to be in at the beginning. OK, all right, all right. It's not always possible. Attorneys has run the case for a year or two and now that file is thick and they send it to use chambers. All right. When they do that, I go through the file, I put up my first draft of particulars of claims and I phone an attorney of record and say, right, I've done this. Now I want an interview. Come to my chambers. As the code of conduct said, do you remember the other clip? And then I do it like that. I'm very strict on these things, guys, because it's you that's getting embarrassed. It's you that's getting blamed. And you're the advocate. You're the specialist. You should have your safeguards in place to protect yourself the whole time. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. You're becoming an advocate. You've got to think about so many things at the speed of lightning. That's an advocate. The attorney's got maybe all the time in the world. He's just going through the file and going through emotions. The moment you're up, you've got to think about so many things. All right. So on page 19 there, if you look at the gray block there, they'll say master the facts of your case even before you send off the letter of demand. All right. Now, usually you won't do the letter of demand. OK, but that's for the attorney. Now, many times I had to go back to the attorney. I said, I'm not going to issue, we're not going to issue some. I said, why? I said, I want you to send another letter. Your first letter is a mess. Come, sit down, let me show you. Show the attorney, there, 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 you had shortcomings, or there, you made a mistake. Back up. Before we go official with this, like in court documents, send another letter and see what the reply back is. Give him a couple of days and see if you can mend your mistakes or supplement your letter if you had shortcomings. Got to, you got to approach the drafting of a particular claim correctly. All right. You read everything, everything they say to each. Why, why, why? Because they might have made some contentions, admissions in emails. That actually changed the nature of the case if you don't look at everything. You know, they say to Canada attorneys, put up a brief for an advocate. But remember, don't put that and put this in. I say to all the attorneys I work for, you never do that with me. I don't care what's in your file. Duplicate it. I'll send your file to me, I'll get it back to you. And I also always, for all my cases I've ever done in my whole life, uh, I have full files on those cases because you have to return a file to the attorney, but I make a copy. So from time to time, I burn a lot of trees. 
All right. Nowadays, you can actually do all of this electronically. Okay. So that's very important information. They're still on page 19. Obtaining and analyzing the facts, uh, case concept. Let me hear from me. Tell me what happened. Now, listen. Before we deal with the writing techniques, you must have an understanding of how to work with the facts of each matter. There is no point in looking at the rules and techniques to tell you how to present the facts if you have no understanding of the facts themselves. This is when you're a newcomer as an advocate, or uh, let me rather say a newcomer as in general a legal practitioner. So you have a new case and I bring you in and you could have listened to all of this. And you're still not fast and you don't have experience. Remember what I said to my first class, don't wear the title of advocate on your shoulders in front of you. You are going to get embarrassed. Rather, if you're a newcomer advocate, always sits with your attorney. And when you and your attorney don't agree in, about something in front of the client, don't get red in the face. Say, all right, we can look at it later or I know where you're coming from. But you have to start learning somewhere. Remember, I walk into a bathroom in the first three, four seconds, it's over. I start asking questions. I know already where they're going. So many times they book two hours from in the bathroom and I walk in there, I listen to three minutes and in 10 minutes I've told them what's going to happen. What are they going to tell me and what I see it? And they say, oh, how did you know? And it's not, it's not being clever. It's years of doing it. Uh, and uh, I don't waste time. I don't sit there to get a fee for two hours. If I'm finished, I'm finished. I take my hour and I walk out of there. You're going to get there. But in the beginning, you need to analyze the facts. You don't know how to do that fast. You haven't developed that normal anticipation of what the law is going to say in South Africa without specifically having studied that specific law. Many times I make a prediction. Oh, I think this is how it's going to work. I'm pretty sure. And when I go read it, it's precisely what it says. Not clever. Never. Never in your life. It's experience because you've worked on the law your whole life. You know the South African context. And then you can anticipate it. It goes like this. But you're not there. You're starting out now. So take your time, read up, and prepare. You're a youngster. Even if you're 40 or 50, you're becoming an advocate now for the first time. So you always say to your instructing attorney, if they want you to draft something, all right, if there's going to be a consultation on this, send me a summary in an email, small paragraph, and go and read everything you can about it. That's how I used to do it in the beginning. Because I'll, I also was sitting in some of these meetings. I don't have a cooking clue what I say. And uh, then I decided it doesn't work like this for me. I want to know what's going on at the first meeting. So I changed my strategy in that first month, two months of becoming an advocate. And I prepared for these meetings. I insist, even today, I insist, send me a summary. Ah, I read it quickly on my phone in a restaurant. I'm up Monday. It's maybe Saturday. Yeah, I know what this is all about. It's very important. All right, so that's that's what I wanted to say there. Let me take you through further. I'm going to take you to page 23 of this of this practical uh, uh, um, manual, and then on page 23 we're going to look at facts and uh, facts that are undisputed. Let's have a look at our page 23. I want to read it to you. He says the the undisputed facts are vital for your application to draft and to present evidence. This applies to both actions and applications. Make a particular note of all the undisputed facts because the undisputed facts, and here's the list of things I want to read to you, are equally important in obtaining the successful outcome. For me, all the facts, whether they dispute or undisputed, I actually never in my mind make this differentiation. I take all the facts, let it flow into the averments I want to make short and concise, and then as short and concise as I can without giving too much away, but without not wrecking the course of action, or being vague and embarrassing because then an uh, exception can be raised against me. I can land off with striking out and there's a whole lot of things can happen there, right? So I don't even think like this. I take all the facts, but this is good. Assist you in determining the probabilities are essential in developing your theory of the case. That's important in your mind, in your legal mind. You're going to change a lot. Becoming an advocate, practice advocate, change you. That's why you should marry later <laughs> if you're still young. Because if you have a girlfriend now in two years, she's not going to marry you because your whole thought process is going to change. It's the truth. At a certain stage, your brain operates in a specific manner. Assist in establishing the actual issues of dispute are essential in resolving disputes. Help to determine which party's version is probable and therefore more persuasive. Okay, now that depends, that depends on your instructions. If you get instructions, you've got to follow your instructions. 
but it's good in the back of your mind to have this knowledge. Assist you to draft persuasive pleadings and affidavits. Pleadings, remember affidavits is motion, uh, application, we're busy with uh, action. Where your version is supported by the undisputed facts, this is most persuasive, are essential to know for purposes of leading a witness in chief and for cross-examination, which is a very important point. You are drafting the particulars of claim now, but you must already draft it with your mindset, if I'm going to take this right through on a cross-examination, this is where I'm going to spend a lot of time, and then you must decide in your particular claims how you're going to cite it so that you can use it in the future. All right, guys, that was an important one for me. Remember, you have to read the whole book on the action procedures. Let's go there. All right, I'm happy with that. That that was for me, basically. Just want to have a look at something before I miss a few things here. Uh, drafting skills is a pleasure. I really enjoy it. If, if I'm going to contact the seller, so we've got a very complicated case. Can you go into lockdown and draft this fast for the next two weeks and pay boo, good money? I really enjoy it. Because you take those boxes of files, big cases, they come there, they empty the boot of a vehicle. And then for two, three weeks, you lock yourself down, you take a strong deposit, uh, or uh, your attorney informs you everything is in his trust account, and then you start working. Drafting is such a pleasure, you have no idea. When you become good at it and you're comfortable with it, you'll, you'll never want to stop doing it. It's like unraveling an investigation every time you do it. All right. So now I'm taking you to... Um, uh, chapter two, the logical thinking. You can go through that in your own time. Uh, it's a very important chapter. You need to go through it, but I don't want to step on that now. All right, and then uh, writing of letters. I'm not going to deal with writing of letters with you, except to say to you, be careful of writing the wrong letters because you can muck up the case. I think I told you my story. I'm going to repeat it. It was last year. Attorney from George. Busy with the case. In now spread again. So from George down to Nelsbrook. And uh, she says to me, I look at the file, I look at the file. She says, listen, uh, I wrote a letter and they said no, but the, the, the homeowners association is not going to replace the wall. End of the story. And I say, oh, really? Okay. I say, I want to write you an idiotic letter. A letter that doesn't make law, it sense in any kind of law. But in the, in the last sentence, I want you to write something specific. She says, yeah, but I don't want to write an idiotic letter. They trust me, we've worked together for a long time. I've read what they're saying to you. I know what they are thinking. And I know what they're trying to do to you. So, so I write a letter for her, I send it through. She looks at it, tweaks it a little bit. She sends it through. It comes back, you're an idiot at 10. So she sends a letter to Mimi and she phones. She says, I told you, now I'm embarrassed. I say, no, 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 no. Look at the last sentence. And they walked right into the trap of the Consumer Protection Act and consequential damages. I Means that wall falls over. And that is how we got him. It was not an hour. Because now we reply to that, let them say, well, in that case, we're gonna out your liable. Let's 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 do this thing. An hour after that, after they walked into the trap, they write a little back to. No, don't worry. We spoke to the homeowners association. They will fix the wall. Nonsense bullshit. They never even took instructions from the client. They looked at his letter. They thought, what a dumb attorney. They replied to it. I anticipated that they were going to say one thing. They said it. We called it liability under the CPA. We threw it one hour. They, and now they, I don't know what they told the clients. I know they did not consult. They sent that letter illegally back to us. Writing of letters. If you are asked to write, uh, to engage your writing of letters, which an advocate you don't normally do. So that's a story for that. Be careful. The last thing about letters, be careful to cancel stuff. Go read a contract. Before you cancel stuff and you have prejudiced, prejudiced your own client. And it cannot be repaired. So that's one thing I also want to bring on your, your attention. So that's reading or writing of letters, but I'm not going to go too deep into that because obviously uh, you're more onto the drafting of pleadings. I'm not going to lock down. Excuse me for a second. All right, guys. I'm back. It's just a sinus. This time of the year, not COVID, science. All right, 
and I all get hysterical and start making phone calls. All right. OK, so that's that. Page 41 in this specific guide, drafting skills. All right, there on page 41, the first thing that caught my eye was good drafting. Remember that good drafting involves obtaining full instruction. What happened? Yes, I'm irritated. I'm so irritated that the clients literally get mad at me. But I want to know everything, and I've got a thousand questions flying through my brain. Because I know when I sit down to drafting, I want to do the best of my ability. I need to know everything. Thorough planning, what area of the law, what course of action? That is the formalities. Remember, I gave you the template now. But in that template, there'll be law. There'll be formalities. There'll be requirements in terms of the rules of drafting themselves. And this is rules 18, 19. This is things that's very important. Applying the principles of plain language and drafting do not sound like a lawyer. Well, uh, do not sound like a lawyer. All right. OK, I think I think that you can clearly see as an advocate when I, I drafted the eight, mil, eight million rand claim for Durban three, four years ago. It was then in the newspapers. The guys in Durban will remember it, that 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 young girl that got raped in the in the in at school. She went to the sick bay right opposite the headmaster's office, and there she got raped by uh, the female girl because another guy said it. Uh, and I put him in the same room as a male and female. And she got raped. So that was the eight million thing. And when they read it, they said, "Oh, this was drafted by an advocate." So you know, I don't know how my you're going to get away from this. But I agree with the plain language. Yeah, sure, we use supra and all those terminologies. And please don't use them if you don't know what I mean. Oh, we get it so much. Why did he put this in here? You know, stuff like that. And uh, so plain language I agree with. But I mean, you will know that this was drafted by a layperson or an or or attorney. And then carefully reviewing the draft. The way I redo, uh, review a draft is I send it around. I send it to the attorney. I say, please pass it on to the client. Uh, sometimes I get permission uh, from the attorney to circulate it above him because I have found a lot of attorneys says, no, it's fine. It's great. <laughs> they say that so quickly. But when you give it to the client, he says, no, wait, I, that's not really what happened. I have found it a million times. So uh, careful reviewing the draft. I don't mind. My attorney saying to me, I don't like that. I don't like that. Then, no, we negotiate it. We look around and I fix it. I am not easily insulted when an attorney tells me that's not precisely what I wanted. Can you change it to me? Or uh, even if he says, I think you quoted that wrong. Then I go and look. I'm not easily insulted. Get his title of advocacy and pride out of the way so you can draft and, and deliver the best possible service. I'm trying to teach you something about this. Advo you're joining the advocates community. Yeah. When you get a title, it's some, it goes to the head of a lot of people. It went to my head, definitely in my younger years. Page 42, before you start. Uh, there on page 42, the ending is before you start. Please have a look at that. There they say, for purpose of drafting, you must be familiar with the following. Please, this is very important. But I'm going to, in my next session, I'm going to show you stuff. Rule 17, and in particular, Rule 18 of the Uniform Rules. Rule 22, Rule 6. The practice directors of the High Court, we intend to issue proceedings. What are they saying? What do they want? And how do they want it, those judges? The Labor Court rules, the practice manual of the Labor Court, the practice manual for a Haiting High Court. This manual is particularly helpful for purposes of drafting. You should have a copy available no matter where you practice. Please have a look at those rules. Remember, that's the formalities. I've given you the template, but you still have to go and look. What does the rule say? If I have a case like this, what must be in there? All right. Especially uh, contracts, especially contracts, especially state organs, and especially the citations of the parties, juristic persons, natural persons, uh, trustees. How do you say minors? I'm going to show you all those things. All right. Then, of course, on page 43 of this guide, uh, basic tactics, techniques. Once you have all the facts, now inquire about the following. What is the dispute between your client and the other side? Why is there a dispute? Uh, what keeps them apart? What happened according to your client's version of the disputed facts? What does the client want? And there it is. What does the client want? So you listen to the case. You see the problems. You hear what I say. What was the wrongdoing against him correlating to what I want? Sometimes you have to say a client, all right, there was wrongdoing, but you cannot get that. You can get this and this and this. 
So that's important. So I like the last name. What does the client want? Why are they here? Because I, I did a, I did an adultery case when that was still doable in this country. And uh, I went, I, I think I spoke to you the, in one of the clips, and I went through that case, and I won it, and everybody was waiting outside the court for me. It was such a big victory. So the order came out, 200,000 damage is payable. In those days, I mean, I'm talking years ago. Go to the client and say, right, the turn is ready to move on this. He says, no, just wanted to win the case. I wanted to make a point. I said, we can enforce this 200,000 damages claim against him. Come on, let's do this now. We won. Let's get a sheriff out there. Let's make this happen. No, nope. he's happy. Feels vindicated. Clients, weird, huh? All right, so that's where we left that. Such a big uh, case. I, all the, even a judge told me he couldn't win it, and, and, and I did it. Um, and even the attorney of record said to me, you can't. And I said, well, do you mind if I proceed if I like I anticipate? He said, no, go for it. I mean, if you get more than I uh, anticipate, it's fine. We'll want it. Client says, I'm happy. I don't want the money. The court orders more than enough for me. All right. Page 45, the cause of action. Oh, this is where you struggle, right? So if you don't clearly set out the course of action, you're going to raise exception. They can have a, even go as fast to get a cost order against you if you're wasting time and your negligence. And when we talk about negligence, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about the bonus to peace cost order. So those things are important, all right? So we uh, quickly have a look at what I'm saying there about formulating and draft course of action. We know that your particulars of claim to be valid in law. You must set out the course of action. That's a requirement of the rules. 18, 19, all of those. Né? Many practitioners struggle with this and invariably end up using a precedent. This is a skill you have to master. It goes to the very heart of your case. You cannot risk getting this wrong. If you cannot sit down a course of action, you're out of there. And you're going to get the cost order against you. And if you're seriously negligent, your client can even sue you. So when you're taking this kind of work and, and drafting these things, you must clearly put on the wrongdoing there. What is the cause of the action? What is the reason? There was a breach of contract. Okay, how did they do it? This is how we did it. All right? You need to have a course of action. There was defam uh, defamation. Well, there cannot be defamation if there's not publicity. So he said you were so-and-so, peep, 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 but there's no witnesses. Yeah, well, are you gonna, what are you going to do with a course of action there? So all of these things are very important. Eh? So you've got to be careful with this. Uh, they go on to say there, as a certain politician once said, Get it wrong will result in consequences too ghastly to contemplate. <laughs> Can you imagine? Before you begin, do you know what happened according to your client's version of the facts? Do you obtain and analyze all the available facts? If not, do not even start. Now, here I want to say something. Do you remember my recording on code of conduct where we said that if a client does not work with you, work against you, you can withdraw. Remember that. You sometimes get clients here that say, I want you to do this. You see, you cannot do it. This is what you have. This is what you, I say. I don't care. There's a court case that says you can walk out and you need to do that. You need to do that before you are liable for cost orders and so on. All right, going on to page 47. Uh, writing the first draft. Page 47, writing the first draft. If you're a newcomer, you're going to start out with this and contracts, everything, drafting. This is what you do. You do it over and over and over. You read it over and over until you're satisfied. Later on, when your experience goes like this, it really does. You pick it up. And there is a legal jargon. Although they say it mustn't sound like an attorney did it, there is an existing legal jargon. You pick it up quickly. And the court understands it. Everybody understands it. The layperson might not totally understand it, uh, but you understand it. All right? Sticking still to plain language, bearing that in mind. Writing the first draft. You are now ready to begin writing the first draft. Here are the steps to be taken. This is page 47. Step one, gather all the known facts. We there. Step two, what do the facts say are the issues? We there. Step three, know the law, the rule. We have said that. Step four, decide on a course of action. What does the law say is your claim? Sometimes there's more than one. Step five, identify all the elements or material facts of the course of action. What are the material facts that have to be proved in the course of action? Uh, let's say the validity of a contract consensus, legality, capacity, and all of those things. Actually, there's five if you're under the National Credit Act because five is formalities. It has to be in writing the contract. 
So, um, so we, we spoke about this. We find, you know, you have to do this research and you're going to make certain that all the, all the requirements, defamation, there must be publicity or you don't have defamation. So these are the things. Step six, ask yourself, do I have the facts according to my version to prove each of those elements? A legal connection causa is required between the elements of the course of action, the facts of your case and the desired remedy. All right. So your remedy at the end of the day is actually what you're going to have in your prayers. That's the remedy. That's how they said it straight. And we've already said that, that if your remedy, remedy, your prayers don't correlate with, with, with what you are saying in front of you, um, um, in the content of your particulars of claims, that's dead. That's not going to happen. That's not what it's specifically saying here. It's saying just that they must relate to their enemy. This is a breach of a contract. Therefore, this happened. That broke. Damage is 10,000 rand. There you go. There you go. Do you see it? The chronological link there. Uh, we take you through each of these steps now. Let's have a look at what it says here. Here are the causes of access most commonly relied on and which you are likely to encounter in your office. Contractual claims, a lot of them. Deluxe claims, a lot of them. Enrichment claims, not too much of them. Statutory claims, a lot of them. Claims of mixed origin, common law and statutory law, for example, divorce and RAF actions. There you go. There you go. Same thing. And labor disputes, you can get a lot of them. Actually, the way they've put it out here, I really like this. Uh, because you can actually build your practice around this and market this. But the ones we're going to be looking at is your contractual claims, your deluxe claims, and then, of course, there, the mixed one, we're going to be looking at your divorce claims. That's what we're doing here. And in the reading list, that's what's important for going up to your exams. All right, we're going over there to page 48. 48. They talk there about, um, um, uh, never forget, uh, there has to be logic in every step. You take... Uh, towards drafting your particulars. Remember always, writing is thinking. Uh, sequencing is logical thinking. Your particulars of claim must be chronological. That's why I do parties and jurisdiction. I don't want the court to wonder where is jurisdiction. Parties, jurisdiction, I can do this. Jurisdiction linked to local standards, the facts come out. This is who the defendant is in relation to this case. He has interest. He has local standing. Right. What was the wrongdoing? Right. Is the damages? What went wrong? What are, why are we here? Statutory and normal notices, letter of demand or whatever. All the annexures, what, what you need there. And if it's a contract, then of course you're going to say where. That's the rules. You're going to attach it. That's the rules. Right. Now prayers. Okay. We said out our prayers and we relate our prayers to the content. Chronological. The template I've given you. I believe is chronological. If you do it like that, always you're going right. So you tell what was the situation, what went wrong, what was the situation, why, why, why was I hurt? Was it damages or why was I hurt? I did give out notices, a notice that I replied was the situation, and this is what I want under my prayers. That's chronological. It has to be like that. You can go through that, take all your facts and arrange them chronologically, prepare a chronological sequence of events. Always ask for documentary proof of the facts. In commercial disputes, in our disputes involving documents, erase documents in a chronological uh, sequence before considering them. I like to do them in date order always. Prepare chronology, uh, chronology documents. One for the whole case, a full chronology of the material facts as to what happened. And one of each witness, a complete chronology of the events making up the witnesses' versions. This is a requirement in the labor courts. Is welcome. Uh, in all the other divisions of the High Court. Before you start writing your first draft, here's a useful checklist you can use. What are the facts that establish the issue dispute? What facts provide an answer to the problem? Look to the facts to find an answer. Establish the main disputes or potential disputes. Identify the good facts uh, in your case, the facts that support your client's version of the disputed facts. That's always important. Identify the bad facts in your case, the facts that support your opponent's versions or the disputed facts and make certain that uh, you're not lying for your client, you're not acting unethically. That's important there. What will the witness say? You can anticipate that, especially on the cross-examination. How will the documents help so you can ask the right questions about the documents and don't waste the court's time? Uh, who will I call as a witness? After interviewing, you can see uh, this one is going to crack or that one is exaggerating, that one is lying. Make certain that you just put witnesses in a box that's strong, credible. What happened between a client and a defendant? I will be the plaintiff and the defendant. Is my client's version of what happened probable given the facts of the case? 
You remember uh, we spoke about it on the Code of Conduct. You may not take a hopeless case to court. Owen and Rogers. And I'm testing you a lot of that on the multi-choice. You cannot take a hopeless case to court. Due to the undisputed facts support my client's version of the facts, what does my client want to hope to achieve by starting litigation? That is, what does he want? He sustained damages. What does he want? Does he want those damages? Uh, and, and of course, your letter of demand, your standard notice, all of that will set it out and we'll see it in the prayers too, right? Can the defendant satisfy uh, a judgment? Can the defendant satisfy a judgment? Let's not go too fast over that one. What does it help you to um, um, sue somebody that's bankrupt? It's got nothing. You're only going to get judgment against him. They're going to be a nulla bona at the return. There's going to be nothing. You're going to win it. What? Oh, sure. Uh, court order is valid for 30 years. If you've issued the necessary writs, say it with that, go read up on that. Making the court order doesn't make it valid for 30 years. There's still a little step you have to take there. All right. But if he's got nothing, you're wasting your time. All right. So that's also important to have a look at. And to bring that under your client's attention before you start drafting a particular sort of claim, to say to your client, this is going to cost you a lot of money, but if, he's ha if he doesn't have money, what's to use? Okay, on page 52, on page 52, we look at the heading there, apply the rules. Let's just look at it again. Remember, I gave you the template. You've got a boat of facts in there. You've got to follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, your opposition is going to take you out. And when they bring exception applications, strike out, or whatever the situation might be, vacant, embarrassing, it's costing your client more. It's going to be upset with you if it's due to you making a mistake. When you write pleadings, you must apply rules 18 and 22 of the uniform rules. You are required to plead material facts only. This is a particular sort of claim, the action procedure. The material facts relied on. Material facts, but not the evidence by which they are to be proved. Remember, I said you cannot plead evidence. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I do, but I have experience. Don't go there. Material field facts, but not the law. Sometimes I take that chance. One out of 100 or two, 500 cases, I'll take that chance. Uh, and I won't take that chance, strictly speaking, in an action procedure. But I have a habit of saying the court in the affidavit of my client that my legal advisor advised me of this court case, and this is right. There's requirements for you, this affidavit must be done, and we did it. I just did it recently for the application in the High Supreme Court for a post napsal application, and there's a nice case in Bluefontein that said it must be like this, and I showed it to the court in the affidavit. But 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 don't really try this thing in the action procedure. And they do uh, take exception. Don't make a mistake, but you know, you've got experience, you can try that, but it's, actually you should not do it. That's actually what I'm saying, and you should not do it. You should wait. And then the material facts in a summary form. So that's applying the rules. So that's important. Please have a look at that. All right, we're paging here. Taking you through the self-assessment book. They're on page 56. I'm sure that the electronic version and the soft copy will have the same pages. At least I hope so. You'll see there in a gray block. Remember, you are not to lose focus on what happened according to your client's version of the facts. This will form the basis for your course of action. This is so important. What happens when you draft and when you are busy drafting and you've had your consultation? You've got all those ideas. You've got all the solutions. And now you start drafting not totally on his version. You're drafting as you see it might fit better. What did we say in the code of conduct? You may not mislead the court. You can get this barred. So please, you must stick with his version. And if you have an idea, nothing prohibits you to phone him. Say, hey, uh, I was thinking about something. Doesn't he says no, or he says yes. Then it becomes his version. You can ask him questions. There's nothing wrong with that. But you cannot draft him what you believe is the right. I've seen people draft and say, sign, this thing is going to work. Stick with it. That is not correct. Eh? So that's what I want to bring on your attention there. 57, you have to work out the essential uh, vermins ingredients or material facts that need to be established before your client's claim can be succeed. We spoke about that. And then your list of material facts will now form the basis of your first draft. All right. And then we said you had to circulate it. All right. They're on page 59 at the bottom. Again, they say, what do the rules say now? I'm uh, And of course, an analyze the, or, uh, analyzing uh, the law. Let's, let's, look, uh, let's look quickly at 
uh, analyzing the law. The best place to look for the law is the most recent judgments on the subject. I agree with that. When you read the judgment, read the whole judgment, consider the facts of the case. If the facts are materially dis uh, disguisable, the case will not be helpful as it will not be binding on the judge. There's something they're saying here that's important. One, if the newest court cases are the best, use starry decisis on these cases, go to the highest authority, and number two, read a whole court case. Just don't read a section, because I think I did tell you about that advocate that jumped up and uh, he was speaking to the judge on the bench. That was the judge in that case, he didn't know it, and it was taken out. Some helpful suggestions. Understand the substantive uh, law which gives rise to the cause of action. Determine which material facts the law requires to make out and sustain a cause of action. Don't worry, don't worry, don't get confused, don't get negative. There's an example in here I'm going to show you. And when you, everything we're doing here, look, it's self-assessment, but I'm taking my time here. I'm not an hurry. Don't get confused, don't get hysterical. It's going to work out. Determine which material facts the law requires to make out or sustain a course of action. That's very important. Always remain focused on the peculiar facts of your case, significant integral facts of importance. Do not lift facts out of a precedent. It will contaminate your client's version and you will pay a price. I'll talk about this in a second. When researching the case, habitually check the annotations. All right, that's also important. Let's go back. I don't have a problem with presidents, and I'm going to talk to you in the next clip to you about presidents. But presidents is problematic because sometimes they're shortened and uh, they don't really fit your, uh, your, your set of facts, and they're just a guideline. So when you use presidents, you must come into the habit to change the language and wording of sentences to what you are doing. And I find that some of the presidents, they don't say everything in the beginning or at the end that has to go on in there. So this becomes dangerous for somebody like you that's new. But I've always felt from the beginning it was a very good book in my position. But later years when I gained experience, I was actually like, actually now I understand it better. Because if I take it now, usually I've already done it. I don't even need to check it. But it does open my mind to a thought process sometimes of expanding my particulars of claim. So just approach it cautiously. It is a very important book, and I recommend it. You buy it. Because for me, it's a very practical book, because in every possible particulars of claim that is out there, it has a kind of a requirement template. And sometimes you find things in there, like under the National Credit Act. I actually saw the other day when I paged through it quickly, wow, when I used to do those cases, we had to do this, and there's actually two extra things by, by, by court cases, by starting dissonance precedents they are building in now, which I didn't know about, and I mean, I've been doing this for years. So be careful of them. I understand this is be cautious, but it's a very good book to have. And then again, what do the rules say? Why do we require pleadings? We require pleadings for the parties to be informed of the issue. A dispute between those between this, so they may prepare for trial, which means both of them must understand what's going on in the documents. If it's very embarrassing, or there's no course of action, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be wasting a lot of time. To inform the other side of the case, they have to meet, that's it. For the court to be informed of the dispute so that the limits of the dispute may be established, that's for the court, for the judge, magistrate, whoever, to define matters that are uh, that are and are not in dispute. And nowadays we try and do that through case flow management, through pre-trials, and we decide uh, what is in dispute or not in dispute. Actually been doing that for years. Then we're on page 60 very quickly. I don't want to take too long. On the, I want to finish with this book before we walk out of here. The main structure, the uniform rule tells you that your particular must contain the following in its main structure. The clear and concise statement of the facts relied on, I've said it now a thousand times. The nature of the claim, uh, we've said that. Conclusions of law, the plaintiff is entitled to deduce from the facts. We spoke about legislation, the relief claimed, and that's the press. So already you will say the damage sustained, you owe me this, and in the press you will claim it. So when I'm looking at the main structure, I'm looking at a template I'm, I've given you, we're good to go. All right, so take a side of relief. It's all good. On the same page, page 60, you can also look at now the drafting of the particulars of claim. I'm going to go through it uh, very quickly because the whole time I've been talking about that. All right, before you put pen to paper, or would I say a finger to a um, keyboard, here is another checklist. This uh, might seem repetitive, 
I agree with repetitive when we teach you always, always. The judge is doing the right thing here when he puts this in his guide. With deceased estates, when you join one of my webinars, I repeat myself over and over because it's a difficult subject matter. It's not because we're stupid. <laughs> but bear with us and you will see the intended benefit. Uh, did you obtain all the known facts? We're good to go. Did you obtain all the relevant documents, including electronic documents? We're good to go. Did you sequence all the facts chronologically? We have a template, so we kind of have that going there. And your documents we're dealing with in, in daytime, except if we have to start explaining technical issues, that might change. Uh, are you satisfied that you know what your client's version is? Oh, yeah. Uh, what is your client's version of the disputed facts? So what's he saying there about that? Can you say what are the facts that support your client's version of what happened? Are you satisfied that your client's version is probably or likely to have happened given the circumstances of the case, uh, which is a sensitive issue when you're going to tell him, well, I, I cannot see this. I, I cannot see this. Do you know how you will prove the material facts of your case? Yes, indeed. Who are the witnesses and what documents uh, support your material facts? Are you satisfied that your witnesses are credible? You've got to test them. I ripped them apart. And uh, I have disqualified a lot of my life, Cinnamon. You're just lying. You're just saying this because this guy is your friend or you don't like the other guy. How reliable and sufficient is the available evidence? How did you ensure that your witness will turn up? And you can force him. Not the end of the world, but when you force him, he becomes uncooperative in the box. So things like that. How did you ensure that you'll be able to provide proof of your material documents? Did you preserve original documents? Do you follow the protocols for preserving electronic documents and metadata? And that is something I had to do in a big fraud case I just finished over 2,000 pages long. So there you have that. That's important then. So uh, I think we're good. I think we have a general idea how to approach a particulars of claim, what we need to do with it, and how to arrive at the end when uh, we actually went through all the pleadings and we are actually in court and we're leading evidence on it. On page 63, what not to plead. Do not plead the following. Immaterial or irrelevant facts. Evidence, never plead evidence. I do sometimes, but I have a way of doing it. Law, legal argument, or vexatious or scandalous matter. Now, sometimes the vexatious or scandalous matter is the crux of the case. Then that's different. Don't be confused by this. But otherwise, you won't do that. So that's important there. I'm happy that we have that there. All right, I'm now on page 67 of this excellent uh, training manual on pleadings, drafting skills. You'll see vagueness and quantum. Now, I'm not going to read it. Well, well, let's read the first sentences because I've said a lot about vagueness. A uh, word of warning, avoid generalized allegations and never be vague about your own particulars. So uh, if your facts are vague or generalized, it may be that you did not obtain full instruction or worse that you that you just used a president. All right. So you've got to be particular. President is just a skeleton, template skeleton, like the one I just gave you. So you've got to, you've got to put it meat in there, right? Quantum. Yeah, let's look at a quantum of amount of your claim. You must set out sufficient uh, particulars to enable the defendant to work out how you arrived at the amounts you claim. This is a formal requirement. Here we repeatedly point out that you are not to inflate your amount. And that's actually what I want to say. It's easy if somebody owes you on an unpaid account uh, amount, and that's a liquidated document, that, that's fine. But uh, when somebody has, uh, when, uh, when, when it's a defamation case, then obviously, or a medical negligence case, uh, then obviously you've got to start working this out. And we take great care to say, well, he's going to go, he's going to have to go for some psychological treatment and the doctor um, um, uh, tariff is so much per hour. So when it goes to quantum, you've got to, you've got to put it. And one of the things in the medical negligence we've done with success, which says that these are not fixed amounts. We start building that nowadays into our particulars of claim. This is not fixed amounts. They can change later on. We put it in brackets in there somewhere, and it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So uh, quantum is important. Don't, don't ever estimate it, all right? Although at the end of the day, that will be within the discretion of the court or what they're going to do with that, all right? All right, so, okay, we're paging in this guide. It's a very good guide, eh? Are you paging through it with me? 70, page 70, they talk about the parties. All right, here we start to show you a physical draft. All right, so have a, let's, let's have a look at it. Are you ready? On page 70, it runs over to 71, and it goes there almost to 72. All right. So there they have it, the parties. You always start the parties, the plaintiff is, uh, the defendant is, all right? So the first plaintiff is, 
The first defendant is if there's more than one, all right. There's your jurisdiction. These guys agree with me. I always put my jurisdiction there. Pay attention to the jurisdiction of the court. The local standard of the painter here, this will flow from the fact that your client was a party to the contract. If it's a contract, you do not have specifically period under the setting, or he's a director in the company, uh, or he was the injured person or whatever. So there must be local standing. They yeah? must have interest. And actually, they do local standing on their own, but you can't always do it. But that's why I said to you, jurisdiction and local standing, going up to the factual background, they, they, they work together. But you can do this. You can build local standing individually. Most of the time, I don't do it except in uh, uh, application procedures. I usually go to my factual background and there you'll see it clearly. But you can do it. You can do this. Local standing of the plaintiff, you can clearly show it. It's actually a good idea for you that's starting out to do it. Then there's the factual background. Uh, set it out briefly. Uh, the contract, if it's a contract, please enter it into a contract. State everything there. What are the material terms of the contract? They are doing this on a contract. And then the plaintiff's obligations there under. Defendant's breach. So what went wrong? Ah, he didn't do this. Or he didn't do that. And then what's the consequences of the breach? Do you remember I spoke about damages and so on? And then what is causation? It's not always obvious why the breach should have led to the loss claim. You have to explain. Establish a causal connection between the breach. For example, he didn't order the industrial crane. The industrial crane was then later ordered because he was negligent, which means a project went in for 20 days extra. That amounted to us having a, a penalty cost amounting to 100,000 rand, and that's the damages we have sustained. Yeah, it can sometimes be really tricky. Eh? That's just off the top of my head. Then you have to look at quantum where you can uh, claim money. What are situations like I've said now? That's quantum. Uh, and what is the relief you're seeking? Uh, and then usually I will also bolt in the relief before I go to the prayer. The relief sought by the plaintiff. Uh, and then, of course, the notice and you will say, but the demand, the relief, I've, I've claimed to the notices, no payment has been forthcoming. So you can deal with that. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that up to that. Let's go back. Let's go back and look at it. Mine is much shorter, but this one is good. You can use this. The parties, jurisdictions, local standards, factual background. This was on a contract, therefore they breach it out into material terms because this is a contract one. Plaintiffs of basis, then the defendants breach in a contract. The consequence of that breach, uh, what happened, what went wrong due to it, we say that. We called it wrongdoing, do you remember? And then causation, what was the damages, the causation, the quantum and the relief. And the relief actually, the one we did, you will find there under the notices or the statutory notices and then the prayers. All right. Then in terms of uh, claims of the Lika 72, kind of important. I'm going to be talking about this more in the second clip. And in my time, that will be tomorrow. It depends if you look everything whenever you look at What not to do? Just have a quick look at that. There is a tendency among practitioners to use precedents for these causes of action. I don't really have a problem with that, but be cautious. We do not recommend this, says Judge Hussain. I respect him. You will be familiar with these precedents as they were very well established. You will see that all motor collisions were caused by the defendant failed to keep proper lookout and failed to avoid a collision when he could and should have done so. And let us not forget that the defendant also failed to apply his brakes timelessly or at all. Very well known in POCs of RAF claims. These statements tell the just nothing as they do not amount to aversion. They are merely unhelpful comments of a general nature. The judge will not know what happened according to your client's version of the disputed facts. Even if you get away with this in your pleadings, you will pay a price at a trial as you will not be allowed to put a version to your opponent's witness. And if your client testifies and comes up with a version, he will be vulnerable to an attack on the basis that he not tell his lawyer and that this version was a recent fabrication. Not persuasive, you will lose. As we show you below, the conduct causing loss and damage must be carefully set out so there is a discernible and persuasive version before the judge. We show you how to do this, and then I go on to do that. You've got to go through that. I just want to come back to this. Good paragraph, no problem with it. I use those terms. I always use those terms, but I elaborate on it. I will say um, uh, uh, he failed to uh, avoid a collision when he could and should have done so, uh, but blatantly ignored the, the, the red light, uh, or blatantly ignored the red light, and therefore he could have done so. And There's a lot of things I do with it. I asked the clients why 
are you saying this? Why are you saying he didn't apply his brakes? What made you to think of it? And they would say, well, he just came right through. He didn't decrease in his speed. And they tell me a lot of things why they think so, all right? So, uh, but we used him and they work. No problem with that. Page 73, the essential elements. Just quickly have a look at that. Let us look at essential elements of a typical claim in delict for recovery of damages caused by negligence. And the plaintiff will have to establish the facts that show in the circumstances that the defendant owes plaintiff a duty of care. This is RAF. Such a duty as care arises where there is a relationship of promiscuity between them. Uh, the well, not this. This might not specifically has to be used for um, RAF, where there is a relationship of proximity between them. It is reasonably foreseeable that defendants' necklace might cause harm to the plaintiff, recklessly driving. Surely, surely that's foreseeable. Things can go wrong. It is fair, just and reasonable to impose a duty of care on the defendant. Defendant necklace breached that duty of care. Plaintiff, as a consequence, suffered injury, loss, or damages. Such a loss and damages was caused by the defense's negligence. The loss is not too remote. It was reasonably foreseeable, both in its nature and causation. Where the plaintiff claims for damage or loss of property, plaintiff must be the owner of the property or the vehicle, or it must be alleged that a risk in the property passed to the plaintiff. And you can go through it in your time, but that is specifically the language you will use. And there you have it. That is, and that is language we use in drafting of POCs. All right. And then again, I give you another one on 74. The plaintiff is the defendant, is locus standi. And uh, this one is a delict. So you can precisely see what I do that. You can go on your own time there. 76, they talk to you about a breach of duty of care. Let's quickly have a look at that. Yes, said, uh, uh, yes, said yeah, that there was a negligent breach of the duty of care. We have mere breach of the duty of care. It does not uh, establish a, a course of action in delict. It must be negligent breach. In state of facts that show there was negligent breach. Please take note of that. You must set out all the ways in which you allege the defendant was negligent. And then you can go through that. So be careful of the breach of duty of care. Is there negligently based to that uh, or is it something else? All right, guys, we're paging there to page 78. That's still going on there. And on page 79, they end there with the prayers. And uh, remember, this is self-evaluation. We're just assisting you to go forward. So that's excellent there. All right. Page 83 is important for me. All right. Now we, I, uh, I've been busy here, I don't know, for almost two hours, right? So here we come. Page 83 is very important to me. Let's quickly have a look at it. There you have it. Particulars of plaintiff's claim, like I said, always type it out, make it nice. The part is listen to the language. Plaintiff is Herbert Maseko, adult male school teacher who resides at 1 to 4 Villacazi Street, Meadowlands, where the plaintiff's identity number so and so. This is a citation of the natural person. Now, there's multiple defendants. Do you see that? First defendant is Edward Brown, again a natural person. Second defendant is Swiss Instruments. That is a juristic person. Look at what they're saying there. Eh? Look at that. Uh, a company duly registered in terms of the company laws of South Africa and having its principal place of business, and that's the way you do it. Eh? So please take cognizance of that fact. There's your jurisdiction. What do they say there? The whole course of action arose within the area of jurisdiction of the Honorable Court, and nothing prohibits you from putting more, more in there. There's more courses of action. You can put it in there if you want to. Then they put Logos Stande on its own. At all material times, places was the owner of the motor vehicle, being a model 2020 owner on X with registration. So what is the Logos Stande here? Tell me. What is the interest here? He is the what of the vehicle? The owner. The finance vehicle. At all material times, second defendant was the owner of a light delivery vehicle being a, uh, a VW Caddy bearing registration. Um, um, K uh, Kilo Hotel Foxtrot 595 Golf Papa. So that is the vermin you will bolt in there. Then it talks about a collision. Look at the language there. And then the first defender's negligence. Let's take a well, let's take a break and look at how they're doing it. Let's just stop here. The collision was caused by the negligent driving of the first defendant who was negligent one or more of the following ways. Right. He was speeding. That's important. He drove aggressively weaving in and out of traffic. I saw that yesterday, always bumping to me. He was in a hurry. Well, I suppose if you're speeding and going like this, maybe you're in a hurry. He failed to stop at the red light. That's a very important one. 
He failed to break in time due to his high speed. There's the correlation. There's the correlation. He crashed into a car which was in the intersection. He lost control of his vehicle. He was drunk. He crashed into the plaintiff's car. There's the correlation. There's the locus standi. That's why the plaintiff is here. There's the link. There's the causation. Plaintiff's car. Plaintiff's car. All right. And then we go to the consequence. Consequence is very important. We just uh, we can just read a few there. As a result of first defendant's conduct, plaintiff suffered the following consequences. Plaintiff's vehicle was damaged beyond repair. That is his vehicle. Plaintiff suffered the following injuries. Fractured skull, ruptured spleen, broken collarbone, twisted left ankle, broken left knee. Immediately after the collision, plaintiff lost consciousness. That's damages. And it goes on there. You can go through it in your own time. So that's how they do it. And then they give you here alternative vicarious liability plaintiff's claims against the second defendant. They show you all of that. Right. Let's have a look at the quantum on page 86. Very important. Look at the detail. In the premises, plaintiff suffered damages in amount of so and so, which is made up as follows. Right. Past medical expenses, future medical expenses, loss of income, cost, uh, cost of tax for six months, tax, uh, taxes of six months, general damages for pain and suffering, loss of enormities, and uh, reasonable value for Toyota. And future medical expenses can be a projection. As long as you based it on the correct fees of a specific medical institution. Now look at what I say. This amount is what you can reasonably claim and defend in court. Do not claim for the FERC. Do not claim for free Miller. That's 966,000. So you must give the court the indication where you're going with this. Then the relief plaintiff is entitled to claim for the demand. So yeah, right. And there's the demand and there's the press. Let's look at the press. There you have it. CD. Cost of suit and further and alternative relief. And payment of the 966. Remember, it must be the same as above. A lot of people make that mistake because they meant, 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 and they forget it to fix it. And look at that. Interest on this amount at 9% per annum from a date 14 days from judgment to date of payment. All right. Okay, guys. So that is then how do you POC. And this is a very good book, isn't it? Eh? I really like it. All right. I'm paging now. I'm on my way to paging now. That's happening there. All right. That's cool then. Let's just keep on paging. I don't want to miss anything that's important. I'm now on page 111. It's all stuff you can have a look through, all things that you must take into regard and go through in your old time and work with it. There's case studies, everything there. All right. And then I get to page 127, and that's drafting the plea. All right. Now, under the introduction there, you are now representing the defendant. You are expected to file a plea. On behalf of your client, what do you do? All right. We deal with the techniques of drafting a plea, and I set it out for there. I want to take you immediately to it. The first thing I want to say to you when you draft a plea is you work in add paragraphs. But it's a specific way I want to start a plea. And uh, usually in the beginning of the plea, I would say, if I don't react to anything, blah, 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 it must not be deemed to be an admission. And we do that a lot also with the with the application procedure. So I don't know if they're going to do it in this guide, but I've got a couple of paragraphs I always built in there in the event that I missed something. And then I say it because if you don't plead to something, you have admitted it. So it's very important that we uh, put something in there to cover us. And believe me, I've won a couple of cases uh, in the past on that where it was not built in. And, and they, they said, oh, it was just a mistake. You can obviously see we missed it. Sorry. It was not built in there, and if you wanted to say that in a generality foundation, you should have built it in there. Okay, guys, so that is important. Go to page 129. There you say the initial steps. That's important to me. Here are some basic steps to take. So now we are defending the defendant. We have to draft a plea now to somebody else, particulars of claim. Do we understand each other? It's worth uh, repeating that you should get the facts first. So you have to have a consultation, obviously. Carry out an analysis on the facts where we recommend above. Find out what happened according to your client's version of the facts. Read all the documentation available, plaintiffs and defendants. It uh, is the facts that will provide you with a defense, yes. Look to the facts for answers. Do not plead a version of the facts that is improbable or implausible. you got to link it to what your client is saying. But sometimes you see real things. And then you've got to bounce it off from him. 
That happened a lot to me. He is not a legal practitioner, so he might say, well, it was supposed to work like that. You'll say that's true, but in law, there's two, three other things, so we can use that too, and that's totally legal. You're not fabricating. Never fabricate, never mislead. Do not plead a version of facts as probable and plausible. Only when you have the facts should you consider the law. Make certain that the law you rely on is supported by the facts of the case. Make certain, read up, look at the newest case precedents. Look for the law in the most recent decisions, and I just said that. And then they say there in the gray block, a defense can be denied as set out of facts recognized by the law as given you a defense or answer to the plaintiff's claim. The bottom line is you can never run with a bare denial. You can never run with a bare denial. I wrote it down somewhere. And then what do the rules say? Just there in the gray block, I want to read something to you. Remember, a case manager will interrogate the facts as soon as pleadings close. Uh, and your client will be compelled to make admissions in an attempt to further define the tribal issues between the parties. And that has a lot to do with case flow management. OK, give me a second, guys. I'm not going to put this off. I'm just going to be back in five seconds. All right, I'm back. <laughs> All right, guys, you're in a good position. You can pause, go get a cup of tea or whatever the situation might be. All right, I'm page one out of 30. And uh, no new options. Let's have a look at that. You are not to create other options for purposes of pleading. For example, the allegations are noted. This is not an option you will find in the rules and besides is meaningless. When you plead as the judge will treat as admission or worse, Treat it as a evasive response. So be careful with noted. I have used it in the past, but then I elaborate, uh, elaborate on it just to, to make it stronger. So I agree with that. I also hate that, especially if we get it, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, especially when you think about replying to a citation of a party. Uh, you might say, well, I don't know. I cannot admit it. I don't know if it's right. I cannot deny it. I don't know if it's wrong. I note it's safe to say that, you know, whatever. So be careful of that. Uh, I do use it there and uh, um, just say much more about it. Don't go into just saying things and not elaborating on them. There, and then, of course, answer, answer the point. There are typically two types of responses that are commonly used by pleadings. A denial of fact which raises a factual dispute or issue plaintiff denies entering into a contract with the defendant and the pleading a defense which introduces a new matter Plaintiff admits signing the contract, but please that the contract was induced by fraud. So that's the directions you can go. And then the grade. But let's read a paragraph too, because this is kind of important. When you deny a venereal fact, you are expected to plead a factual basis for denial. Can they have a bare denial? Uh, why are you denying this fact? A bare denial is not a proper plea and will be considered to be evasive. A case manager will not allow you to get away with a bare denial or any form of form from a basis response. And that's why case flow management is now apparent. You walk in and say, sorry, it's not happening. Know that a defendant who fails to deal with an allegation will be taken to have admitted the allegation. And this is now with the case flow managers. This is now applied a lot more strictly. So please have a look at that. Then we're going to page one out of 32. Uh, let's talk about what they call the test. The following regarding your version is essential and is worth repeating. The facts must be relevant to the dispute. The facts must be capable of being proved in court admissible. The version of your client's fact must be probable, not something stupid, idiotic. The facts and documents must be arranged in a chronological sequence. Keep on saying it. Keep on repeating it. Now, drafting the flea. Let's see. Let's see what's happening here. Use the following practical suggestions. Now, what I want to say to you again is put a heading in there. Put a paragraph in there. I've told you to put in, say no. If we don't uh, reply to anything, then it's not an admission must not be viewed as an admission. Um, use that, still use that, regardless of the case managers. Before working on a rough draft, write down the material facts on which your client relies. Write each fact using a number, a numbered paragraphs. I'll explain that now. Write down the conclusions of law that you want. Where do you want to arrive? Establish where the facts of your clients versus support the conclusion of law you want. Ask how you will provide proof of the facts in court. There is no point in pleading facts you cannot prove in court. Apply your mind to the questions of owners and duty to begin. Always be, be clear on where the owners lay. Sometimes it shifts. Um, 
Remember that it's not advisable to plead in a manner that might attract the owners or impose on the defendant the duty to begin. That happens sometimes. Apply your mind to the fact that your client will be subjected to cross-examination based on the plea. Always think there's going to be a test. Cross-examination is the test. Apply your mind to the appropriate prayer. In some cases, you may have to propose alternatives to the relief claimed by the plaintiff. Okay, now I want to talk about the numbers. They call it... Uh, uh, now, what you usually do is now listen to what I'm saying to you. This is very important. When I set up a particulars of claim, I number my paragraphs in the middle of the of the of the of the of the document. So in the middle, one, two, three, four. If I have 1.3, 1.1, whatever, I go to the side. So that's how I set up my particulars of claim, and I make everything in bold. Everything in in my stuff is in bold. When I plead, I do the same. The number of my pleading document that has nothing to do with the particulars of claim in the middle, one, two, three, four. Then at a side, at AD paragraph, bold underline, and that paragraph, at paragraph 2.3, is the paragraph number in my particulars of claim. And that's at the left. That's how I do it. That's how everybody uh, does it. But I see people get confused. I see it so many times in exam papers. Uh, beginners get confused. They don't know which number is which number. I'm going to say it again. Are you ready? In my particulars of claim, my paragraph numbers are in the middle. It's my numbers in that document chronologically. In my pleading, my chronological numbers for the pleading, the same, in the middle down. Then to the left, at paragraph, bold underline it, and then the number behind that is the paragraph coming out of my particulars of claim. Because I'm pleading to that paragraph in my particulars of claim. And the add paragraph refers to that, not a number in the middle of my uh, opposing a pleading. All right. Okay, so that's good there. All right, so on page 133, please go through the standalone paragraph. When you draft a plea, you are responding to someone else's particulars. This does mean that you are strictly tied to the formatting you plea according to the paragraphs of the plaintiff's particulars of claim. In fact, your claim's version may be such that you are unable to provide a logical explanation of it by responding to the plaintiff's particulars paragraph by paragraph. Now, when it happens that um, I just want to say uh, admitted, maybe the parties, that's paragraph one, two, three, two, five. I will say at paragraph one, two, five. But the whole pleading must be in sequence. So you understand what I'm saying? So let's say uh, at paragraph one, at paragraph two, at paragraph three to six, following one is at paragraph seven. Those numbers referring to the particulars of claim. Please go through it here. Make certain you do it. You, you you facilitate this process correctly. I've seen that people have a problem with that. Special plea. Sometimes you raise a special plea like an exception. Uh, in appropriate uh, cases, you um, um, uh, wish to plead the special plea. This must be pleaded separately under the heading special plea. So you won't say just plea. You'll now say it's a special plea. So we all can, we all can see this must be dealt with usually very urgently. This paragraph is pleaded at the beginning of the plea. These pleas are usually based on a point of law and are capable of being dealt with before entering of the merits of the case, like an exception. So you'll do that first and then the rest will follow below. Please read through that. In drafting all pleadings, use plain language, the same as POCs, avoid jargon, avoid uh, archaic expressions, year and four before stated. I use that a lot in uh, paragraphs, in uh, contracts. Avoid the use of foreign languages, Avoid the use of long sentences. Avoid a big word when a small word will do. That's not always possible. Use numbered paragraphs and headings. Headings is very important. We know where what this makes it needs. And you must be proud of the product you, you present. Use the recommended font and spacing. I always use. You can write it down if you want to. I use Arial. Um, 10, 1.5. Arial 10 spacing, 1.5. That's how I work, and I've been taught like that years ago in the advocacy chambers. All right. You want me to say that again? Arial, uh, font 10, spacing 1.5. Please go to page 139. I want to show you how a uh, plea looks. Now, there you have the plea. First, the uh, defendant's plea. Do you see? At paragraph 1 to 5. Now, do you see the first one? I always put that in the middle. Because for me, that takes the confusion away. 
And I teach people to rather do it so it's not on top of each other. So that first number one with the dot will be in the middle of my page. My page will start with add paragraph one to five and it will be bold and underlined. The next one is six and there it goes. All right. Now when you page to page um, um, 140, you'll see it goes on there. 8, 9, 10 to 12, 13, 14 to 20, 27 to 29. And that's the way it goes. All right. Uh, one of the problems here, I'm actually picking up now. I'm not seeing number seven, but go through it. Maybe there's a good reason for it. All right, so that's how it works. And it's as easy as that. I just want to look at something. Did they build something in here? No, they didn't. Usually just above one, I'll have a paragraph in there that says, if I didn't plead to anything here under in the POC, then it must not be deemed to be admission of anything. That's what I put in there. And I'll put it in there until the day I die. All right, there we go. That's it. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. When you get to page 143, you are with motion procedures. That results under the um, um, application uh, uh, action procedures. I just want to look at something here. I just want to look at something here because um, um, I think I'll make a point of that in tomorrow or when I come back for the second recording. Um, I very much want to show you what cases specifically goes under action procedures. We already did it. I just want to see if I can be something more in that and what specific goes under uh, application procedures. It is in here. I just want to make that very uh, clear to you so that you don't get confused. All right, guys, this is the practicing drafting skills of just Judge Hussein, Senior Counsel, Advocate Hussein. And that's a very, very good book. It's a good book. You cannot get beyond it. The next one I'm going to explain in the next recording for you, whenever you look at it. For me, that's tomorrow when I come back to this institution. It's the Amless President of Pleadings of Arms, the eighth edition. And uh, it is mentioned in your reading list. And uh, so I want you to set it up. In any event, if I'm not mistaken, it was just to say to also set up the reading list for the LPC. I'm under that understanding. So then you must also purchase this book. This is a brilliant book and it has to do with the presidents, the templates that everybody is cautioning you against. But I tell you, this is a brilliant book. Uh, as long as you understand that you're an independent thinker. And when you work through this, you're going to apply them to your facts as your fact stands. And that's why that's why he's warning young, youngsters. But it's youngsters that need this, according to my opinion, because they don't always know where to start. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it from this recording number one, part one of the of the of the drafting of pleadings. And I'll be back with the next one uh, for you shortly for me tomorrow morning. All right, guys, have a good one. Hanging there. You're going to do this. You're going to make it and you're going to become a brilliant advocate.